You guys can remain seated. I'm going to read a few verses here, and I'm not going to make you stand through the whole thing. Um, feel the Holy Ghost here. I'm thankful for, for leadership that is um, sensitive to the presence of God. And, you know, anytime we gather together, we think a lot of times we come with, with expectations of what we think God is going to do. Because, you know, a lot, of our, a lot of the times we gather, it, it looks somewhat similar. Um, but we always need to have that flexibility to give God room to do whatever he wants to do, right? And if that means we don't preach, and if that means we don't get to all the songs that we practice so hard for, and if that means church gets out at 6.30 or church gets out at 8.30 or whatever it may be, that's not going to happen tonight, so you guys can take a deep breath. But we just need to be flexible to what God's doing, so thankful for the Holy Ghost here. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to speak for a few minutes tonight on, um, on a word I, I think the Lord's given me for, for our church for tonight. Uh, what I want to talk about tonight is, is, is kind of an ideal about what I believe the Bible teaches that the church is supposed to be. I was, I was thinking about this this afternoon. I've got, I've got a phone in my pocket. Does anybody have one of these? Most of us here? We, you know, this one's a few years old, but it is, it's a, they used to be, you know, way back in the day when you would actually have to pick up the phone and hang up the phone, they kind of just did one thing, but these have really turned into multifaceted devices. They, they do a lot of different things. You know, we love our phones, and, and, and for most of us, if you, anybody ever leave the house, and you get down the road, and you start doing the frantic pocket slap, and you realize you forgot your phone, and, and really, there is a, a feeling that I can't, I don't know if I can leave the house for an hour without this thing. What if I get into a car accident? What if I get, whatever, what if I get mugged and I need to call the police? Whatever it may be, we just make up, but we just, we, we, we really depend on these things heavily. They're multifaceted devices. They do a lot of different things, right? My, my phone is a great calculator. It's a great reminder system. It's a great calendar. It's a, it's got a couple of games on it that my kids play more than I do. It's got a lot of, it, it takes pictures and holds pictures. It does a, a lot of different things that I would admit are things that this device does. But there is a primary purpose of why I have this device, right? There, there is a, there are a lot of, I guess, a lot of what's about what it is, but there really is only one why, if that makes sense, as to why I have it. I think the church is, is a similar thing in that there are a lot of things that the church is. The church is a home for the broken, right? It's a refuge for people that are seeking shelter, right? It's a hospital for the sick. It's a community of... There, there's a lot of different things that we can say, yeah, the church is this, the church is this. It's, it, the church is very multifaceted, but I do believe that Scripture is consistent that... You know, we can go beyond what is the church, and there is an answer to the question, why is the church? Why did God establish the church? And that's what I want to look at tonight. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of John, the gospel of John. We're going to start at the very beginning, in John chapter 1, verse 1. Can my Bible quizzers say amen? We're memorizing uh, these verses this year. This is actually the first verses of their study for this upcoming quiz season. So, John chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This, this word, Word, is, is the Greek word logos. And what this refers to is, you, you could think like the mind of God. It's the the reasoning of God, the nature of God. It's, it's, it's the nature of God that is really, it really encompasses everything that he is and everything that he thinks and every way in which he reasons. And the Bible says that in the beginning was the word. We need to understand, it's, this is something we just can't even really wrap our minds around. God has always been. It, it, the Bible, we, you know, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created. This doesn't say in the beginning began the word, but in the beginning it just was. God, God has always been, right? This is, we, we serve a God who's, who's eternal. And the Bible says that this word, it, it was God. It was everything that God is. Verse 2, 
he was in the beginning with God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Or in the English Standard Version, the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 6, there was a man who was sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about that light that all men through him might believe. John the Baptist was not that light himself, but he came to bear witness about that light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. I want you guys to see this. In him, in the word, the word which is God, was this life, and the life is described as light. And what John is proclaiming, what John is preaching, is that this light is getting ready to come into the world. This, this, somehow this form of God himself, the God that has always been, the God that existed for all of eternity before any of this was even created, that, that God, and in this God, he describes it as light, and, and this God is getting ready to make an entrance into the world. In verse 10, he was in the world, the world was made by him, yet the world did not know him. We know this is speaking of Jesus Christ. In verse 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And finally, in verse 14, this word became flesh and dwelt among us. God himself, the Bible says, this was the light that was coming into the world. This, this, was, this was the creator God that was making an appearance in the world that John preached about. And the Bible says that the way that he did that, the way that, the way that God made his entry into the world was that he became flesh. And he dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I want to talk for just a few minutes tonight about the body of Christ the body of Christ. Let's just uh, set our Bibles down. You guys can remain seated, but let's pray. Let's ask God if he would reveal some things in his word to us tonight. Lord, we love you, God. We are thankful for your presence, God. We feel you so clearly in this house right now. God, we are looking forward and, and excited about what you've got planned for these next few minutes. God, I pray that your word would become alive to me. God, I pray that I would hear you speak through the words on these pages. God, I pray that I would feel your presence moving, Lord, between these seats and these rows. God, as your word is spoken and as your word is made alive and made manifest among us tonight, God, I pray that it would fall on good soil in my heart, God. So whatever it is that you want to say and whatever it is that you want to do can actually take root in me and change something about the way that I live my life. And God, I thank you for what you're doing tonight. We give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I, I had a, um, a, a revelation of sorts in the last several weeks, maybe. That's been really helpful to me. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we get so caught up in the things that we're supposed to be doing as the church and talking about what the church is supposed to be. And we have, we find ourselves, you know, sitting in these seats and in this sanctuary week after week after week as the preacher takes the pulpit and just sometimes, sometimes it just feels like a, a nudge, like we got to do more. We got to go further. We have to, and, and this is biblical. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but this, this revelation, it, it just, it just really helped me. And it was this, God does not need your help with anything. There is nothing, and by nothing I mean nothing. There is nothing that God needs from you. There is absolutely no way in any facet of your life that God depends on you for anything. I, I'm reminded, you know, because we're talking about this capital campaign, we're talking about souls, we're talking about reaching the lost. We need to know 
Some of us, you particularly need to know, God does not need you. And as a matter of fact, if he wanted to, God can do this all by himself. Right? I, 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 read, in, I read in the creation story about a God who, I can't, even, I can't even picture this in my mind. There is nothing, and he speaks, and then there is something. Something that didn't exist before, he speaks... If God wants to save a soul, God does not need your help. I, I'm, I'm reminded, I, you know, if you ever read in, in the story of Esther, there's this, this phrase that's always stood out to me. And Mordecai has come to Esther, and he's pleading with her to go to the king and to, 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 to go before him and ask him to have mercy and to do something about what Haman is trying to do and to do all these things. But, but there's this phrase that Mordecai says when he speaks to Esther, and what he tells her is, if you don't go... Our deliverance will come from some other place. We, I, I think there, so often we take on this pressure with my loved ones and my family members in my city that I am the last chance that they have for salvation. And if I don't go, and I, we, we sometimes it's like we're, you know, we don't try to do this, but it's like we're Superman coming in to save a city. If I don't go, if I don't do this, then they're going to be forever lost and the whole world is depending on me. And if I don't, God will find a way to reach his people. Um, in Acts chapter 17, if you guys can put it on the screen, I don't think I gave you this verse, Brother Trey. And if you can't find it, Brother Trey is just learning how to do the media and this is a terrible night for him to be getting started with me preaching. But if you have a chance to find it, Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25, Paul, he says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples made by human hands. He goes on to say, He also is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else, right? He says, God is not worshiped as though he needs anything from us. And Paul goes on to say, as a matter of fact, everything that we need comes from him. He says, there is, there is nothing in this life in which God depends on you and me. But there is also nothing in this life in which you and I do not depend upon him. Right, And I think sometimes when it comes to the lost, this is something that we need to understand. In order to reach our cities and to reach our families, God, and, and I'm gonna, we're going to unpack this a little bit, but God does not need us. God, God can speak. I, I believe if God can speak the word and make an animal, God can speak the word and save my family member. Right, I believe if, if, if God, if an infinite, omnipotent spirit can take on the form of a human being to die for my sins, I believe God can find a way to reach my brother or reach my sister. He can do it with me or he can do it without me. Right? And the Bible actually says in, in 2 Peter, Peter says, the Lord, he's, he's not slack concerning his promise. He was talking about the last days. He was talking about uh, the rapture of the church. And he said in, in the last days, there are going to be some skeptics that say, hey, You've been saying the Lord is coming, but where is he? Everything is just the same as it's always been. And he wanted to remind the church, God is not slow about his promise. God is not behind. God is not late. But he said, as a matter of fact, he is patient with us. With, you know why? Because it's his will that nobody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I believe the Bible is clear. Everybody is going to have an opportunity. Everybody is going to have a fair chance. And could it be that we wait and we wait and we wait for the Lord's coming, but the Lord is prompting us and prodding us to go out and to preach the gospel to people who need to hear it, and we resist him and we resist him, so he needs to find somebody else to give them the job to do the same thing, and they resist him and they resist him, and he needs to find somebody else, and we have areas of this world that have not been reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so the Lord is not late, and the Lord is not behind, but the Lord is patient, because it's his will that nobody would perish, but that everybody would repent. God doesn't need us. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. And, and that begs the question, why? 
then, then why? why? Then why, why was I even created? What am I even doing here? I, for whatever reason, God existed for all of eternity that way. And we reach this point in time where God says, now I'm going to create. I'm going to create heaven. I'm going to create earth. I'm going to create the sky. I'm going to create the waters. I'm going to create the animals. I'm going to create the plants, and I'm going to create mankind. What was it after, can't even put a number to it, after all of this time that God finally says, now I'm going to create? And specifically, why is it at this point in time that he would create me? And that he would desire to use me. I don't know. (laughs) I'll tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And Paul says all things... Somebody say all things. Somebody say that means you and me. He said all things were created by him and for him. They were created by him and they were created for him. So we know that he created us for himself. Revelation chapter 4, the Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure... They are and were created. That's about all we get when we read our Bibles as to what it is even that we're doing here. I think that's enough, though, that we can, we can build off of this. But the Bible teaches us that we are created for God's pleasure. God takes pleasure in you. That goes for every person in this room. That goes for every person in this city. It goes for every person on this planet. If you were created by God, you were created for God, and you were created for his pleasure. God takes pleasure in having relationship with you. It it brings God joy to have relationship with you. You need to know God desires to have a relationship with you. Whether you are a saint that's been a part of this church for a long time and you've grown distant and calloused, or you're somebody who doesn't even really know much about this Bible or this faith at all, God takes pleasure in having relationship with you. God desires, deeply desires to have a relationship with you. We're going to look here about how much he actually desires that. The Bible says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, got a lot of scripture tonight. The Bible says that the Lord himself, this is talking about the rapture of the church, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and who remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And this last phrase, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It is the intent of God. It has always been, it currently is, and it always will be the intent of God for the people that he created to live forever with him. It is is the intent of God for your life that you have a relationship with God and that you spend forever in relationship with God. Uh, The Bible tells us in John chapter 14, Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if, if I go and prepare a place for you, he says, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Why all of this? Why, Why heaven? Why is all this that where I am, there you may be also. It's, it's the intent. This is so simple, and some of you are like, will you get on with it already? Some people need to hear this. This is so simple, but it's, it's so profound at the same time. It is the intent of God, the plan of God, for us to be in relationship with him, and it was always the intent of God that man would live forever with him, and he finds pleasure in having a relationship with us. This is consistent going back to the very beginning. The Bible says that when God made man, 
that he placed Adam and Eve where? In the garden called Eden. That, that word Eden, does anybody know what that word Eden means in the Hebrew? It means, I don't think this is coincidental, it means pleasure. God, God found pleasure in this creation of Adam and Eve. He found pleasure in this relationship that he had with the people that were made by him and for him. And the Bible says that God placed them in this garden of pleasure. And he, in this garden, he gave them access to everything. And, and we're getting into a youth lesson here that we did recently, and you guys need to bear with me. But in this garden, God put two special trees right in the middle of the garden. Right? We always think about that tree of knowledge and good, of good and evil, but there were actually two special trees that God put in the middle of the Garden of Eden. There was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and there was the tree of life. Right? And the Bible says that Adam and Eve were given this instruction to not touch or eat of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil lest they would die, but there was no such instruction that was given about the tree of life. There was no restriction on the tree of life. The tree of life was to be treated like any other tree that they could eat from. Why? Because it was the intent of God that they would live forever with him. Genesis chapter 3 verse 22, the Bible says, this is after Adam and Eve fell. The Bible says, the Lord God said, behold, the man is become like one of us to know good and evil. And he says, now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Right There was this understanding that eating of the tree of life would cause man to live forever. It was the intent of God that Adam and Eve would live in pleasure with God forever. That's where he made them to be. That's, that's where he designed for them to be. That was the plan that he had for their life. And we all understand that it was the sin of Adam and Eve that separated them from God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, is this okay, everybody? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden to work it, to keep it, and the Lord God commanded him, saying, you can eat of any tree you want, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This is a promise that God gave to Adam. At some point, this promise was also relayed to Eve because she, she explained it to the serpent when the serpent spoke to her. But God told them that if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. We know if we go on to read the story that they didn't die. They went on to bear children. They went on to have a family. It was a dysfunctional family. But they went on to, to have a future. They didn't die like the Lord said that they would die. But we, if we read a little further, we see that there is, there is a, more, a more spiritual application here. In, in Genesis chapter 3, going back to the verses we read just a minute ago, he said, and let, lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever, verse 23, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken, and he drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden, at the east of the garden of pleasure, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to tree, the tree of life. Adam and Eve, who were created for the purpose of living forever with their creator in a way that brings pleasure to him. Because of their sin, the Bible says that they were separated from that pleasure. They were separated from the presence of God. They were drawn out of the place that represented pleasure and relationship with their creator. And the Bible says that their separation from God, if we read further and we read it the way that Paul explains it in the New Testament, this was a spiritual death that they died. When we read our Bibles, starting from the book of Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation, right? Genesis is not just a creation narrative it's not just a Sunday school story, but Genesis, these first few chapters, what it does is it sets the stage for the condition that the human race finds itself in for thousands of years to follow. And what the Bible is, is a collection of writings that represent one story of reconciliation. I want you to think about this. The entire Bible, the entire Word of God God made man with the purpose 
of mankind being in relationship with God forever. Sin enters into the picture and separates man from God. And the entire Bible, from Adam and Eve to Noah to Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the prophets, the disciples, Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, the writings of Paul, all of it is a story of God doing everything that he can to bring his people back into covenant relationship with him. The entire Bible is a story of God doing everything that he can do to reconcile his people back to him, to fulfill that original purpose of living forever with his people. And ultimately, God has reconciled himself to his people through Jesus Christ. And in this, this, if we look back again at John chapter 1, you don't need to put it on the screen, but we look again at John chapter 1 at what exactly God did. And the Bible says that the infinite God, he took on flesh, and through Jesus Christ, he reconciles the world back to himself. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. Paul says all of this is from God, who through Jesus Christ has reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God, he says, through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself. And verse 19, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he entrusted to us the message or the ministry of reconciliation. Just just very briefly, if you want to know what reconciliation is, in order to reconcile, you have to imagine you have two parties that are at odds with one another, right? For whatever reason, somebody has wronged somebody and, and our relationship is damaged. We used to be friends and we're no longer friends. We used to be connected and we're no longer connected. So in order for two parties to be reconciled, it takes both sides reconciling themselves to the other. Right? If, 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 we, if, our, if our friendship is damaged, we, we can't be friends again just because I say that we're friends again. <laughs> you might have some people in your life that are like that, that they're your friend, but you're not their friend. <laughs> but in order to have that relationship restored, it takes both parties reconciling themselves to each other. And the Bible teaches us that God, through Jesus Christ, has reconciled himself to us. God has done his part through the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's, he's extended his hand of forgiveness. That veil that used to separate us from his presence has been torn, and he's made a way for us to be restored and renewed in relationship with him. And Paul goes on, this is not what we're talking about tonight, but Paul goes on to tell the church, you need to also be reconciled to God. Right, We need to reach out our hand to him as well. We need to repent of our sins. We need to be baptized in Jesus' name. We need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We need to give ourselves to God. He's made a way for us to be reconciled. He's already done his part. He's waiting for us to do our part. So the Bible teaches us that through the body of Christ, God was reconciling his people back to himself. The man, Jesus Christ, we have to understand, was God in flesh. He was 100% God, and he was 100% man. He was God in the form of a man. We're not going to spend an hour tonight on an academic study of the oneness of God. We just have to have this understanding that God took on the form of a man, that God took on flesh. And it was in this human body named Jesus Christ, that God reconciled himself to us. God opened that door for mankind to be restored through the body of Jesus Christ. The purpose of Jesus Christ, Jesus, he, he did a lot of stuff. There was chapters and chapters and chapters of things that Jesus did. But Jesus' purpose as far as why he came and why he was here. The Bible says in John chapter 3 that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent his son into the world for what purpose? That the world through him 
might be saved. It was the, the, the purpose of Jesus Christ was not necessarily just for sick people to be healed. Did he do that? Yes, he did. It wasn't necessarily just for, for dead people to be raised. Did he do it? Yes, he did. It wasn't necessarily just for scriptural principles to be taught. Did he do that? Yes, he did. But the reason why he was sent was that the world through him might be saved. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus has entered the house of, of Zacchaeus, and, and some people have a problem with that, and Jesus makes it very clear in verse 10. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The body of Christ, that, that, that man that was God wrapped up in flesh, why was he here? What was his purpose? It was to seek and to save the lost. Luke chapter 4, verse 42. When it was day, Jesus departed, and he went into a desert place, and the people sought him, and they came to him and stayed with him, that he should not depart from them. But Jesus said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. And he says, for therefore, can we go to verse 43? He says, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for therefore am I sent. That is he says, is why I'm here. That's what I was sent to do. You want me to remain with you. You find comfort in my presence. You find comfort in my fellowship. But he says, the reason why I'm here, the, the, the purpose for me being sent was that I might preach the kingdom to people who need to hear it. Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, God in flesh, he had one purpose, and his one purpose was souls. His purpose was other people. Jesus, if you listen to the words of Jesus, Jesus was never concerned about himself. Jesus never, never spoke of his own comfort other than to say, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus wasn't about about accumulating wealth or, or, or finding comfort, right? Jesus is the one who says, hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. Just seek the kingdom of God and do the will of the Father, right? Jesus had just, he just had, he was single, single-minded and he was just so, so focused in what he was sent to do. And the purpose of the sending of the body of Christ was to fulfill the will of God, and that was to reach lost people. Jesus did not have his own will. And if you read the words of Jesus, you'll find out very quickly and see very clearly that what Jesus was, was a conduit for the will of his Father to be accomplished. Jesus says over and over again, I have a couple of verses here that we'll read, I'm not here to do my own will. I'm not here to do what I think is best. He says, I I'm only here to do the will of my Father. I have one mission, I have one focus, and all that he was, the body, this, we're talking about the body of Christ. All that he was, was a conduit for the will of God to flow through. God speaks, and I do. God speaks, and I move. The Father prompts me, and I respond. And he says, anything that I do is not of myself, but of my Father who sent me. John chapter five, verse 19, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus pretty much says the same thing. I can do nothing on my own. He says, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of of him who sent me. John chapter 6, I have come down from heaven, Jesus says in verse 38, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus preaches this and establishes 
this mission and this principle over and over and over and over again, trying to get something through to his disciples, trying to get them to understand his mindset. This was the mindset that, that many years later, Paul says to the Philippian church, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. There was, there was a mindset that he had that he was trying to instill in the people that were following him. And his mindset and his, his philosophy was, I am not here to do what I want want to do. The purpose of my existence is to be a conduit for the will of God to flow through to affect this world. And this, this comes to fruition. We see it in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus is praying in the garden of Gethsemane and the Bible says that going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, Father, if it be possible, we, we start to see the will of, of Jesus coming out a little bit here. He says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But very quickly, he reverts back to nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, the, the body of Jesus Christ was a conduit for the will of God to be done in this world. The body of Christ was a conduit for God's will to be done. And what was God's will? God's will was to reconcile his people back to himself. That's what it's always been about and that's what it will always be about. And God has been doing everything that he can to restore lost people back into relationship with him. And he had a man who would say, not as I will God, but as you will. I'm not here to do what I want to do. I'm not here to find my own comfort and I'm not here to pursue my own ambitions, but I'm here just to be a vessel, just to be an instrument, just to be a conduit so that God has somebody that he can work through so that his purpose and his will can be accomplished in his world. And this is what Jesus did. This was the purpose of the body of Christ. God in flesh, God as a human body, the purpose of this body was just that. And the Bible teaches us that in the same way in which Jesus was sent, he also is sending us. John chapter 20, Jesus has, has resurrected from the dead and he appears to his disciples. And the Bible says that on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of Jesus, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and they were glad when they saw the Lord. And in verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. As the Father has sent, in the same manner in which God has sent me, for the same purpose for which God has sent me, in the same fashion in which I came and I have been vulnerable and I have laid down my life and I exist not to do my own will but only to be a conduit for the will of the Father to flow through in the same way in which he sent me, that is the way in which I am sending you. It makes a lot of sense when we read what the Apostle Paul said that the head of man is Christ and the head of Christ is God. And he says in that, that, that same relationship that I had with my father, where I don't exist to pursue the things that interest me, but I'm just his instrument. He says, that's, that's how I'm sending you. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. A little while later, Jesus said to the 11, go into all the world. This is the sending. The, he tells them to go. He's sending them out. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It sounds a lot like what we read in Luke chapter 4, where Jesus originally told them, I, I can't stay here with you. I have to go and I have to preach the kingdom because that is what I was sent for. And now that we turn, we turn the page a little bit, and he tells his disciples, now it's time for you to go and to preach the kingdom and to preach the gospel. Why? Because in the same way in which the Father sent me, in that same way I am also 
sending you. In Matthew chapter 28, the Bible says that Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, so go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. What, what did I do in my sending? I made disciples. I made followers. I made people that, that would lay their lives down and give up everything for the cause of the gospel. I'm asking you, because as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. You also go and make disciples of all nations. And, I, and the things that I taught you, I want you to take those things and I want you to teach them. He says, the same way in which the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. Uh, Jose or Holly, if you want to come, I'm, I'm closing here. Paul, he, in, in multiple occasions in the New Testament, Paul describes the church as the body of Christ. The body of Christ. This, this is not a metaphor. This is not, not some kind of allegory or anything. He, he tells the church, I think it's in, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, Every, every husband should love his wife as he loves himself. And he says, because nobody ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it in the same way that the Lord does to the church. Why? Because he says, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. He's, he tells the church, and I'm not going to go into all the verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but, but very, very thoroughly that you as a whole are the body of Christ. And as individuals, you make up different members of the body of Christ. What I want us to understand and what I want us to take home with us tonight, the purpose of the body of Christ, the original body of Christ, of Christ, the first body of Christ, God in flesh, God making his way into this world. The purpose of the body of Christ was to be a conduit for the will of his Father, with nothing interfering, with nothing getting in the way, with nothing serving as an obstacle. God didn't have to shake him down to get him to do what he wanted him to do. Right, The father didn't have to beg and plead with, with, with that body to get him to, to carry the cross. As a matter of fact, there were disciples that begged and pleaded with him and said, be it far from you, you're not going to do this, you're not going to die this way. And he rebuked his own disciple for getting in the way of what his father wanted to do through him. And he told his disciple, you are so mindful about the temporary things of man, but you neglect the things of God. The, the father didn't have to push him, didn't have to shake him, didn't have to, to persuade him. The purpose of the body of Christ was just to be vulnerable. God, I belong to you. I don't resist you in any way. I, I, I live just to be an instrument of the Spirit of God for His will to be accomplished in my world. And what is His will? Jesus said very clearly what the will of the Father was. He said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. I have come that I might preach the gospel and preach the kingdom to people that haven't heard it. I, I have been sent not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. He said, my, my purpose in my sending was the salvation of other people. The, the purpose of my sending was the souls of other people. And he made it so clear that in the same way that I was sent, my church, I'm sending you. And, and just in case it's not clear enough, you are members of his body 
and of his flesh and of his bones. It was the will of God to kind of set the bar with the man Jesus Christ for what the church would look like for thousands of years to follow. It was the will of God that everything that the man Jesus Christ was and did and and obeyed and what his purpose was and in the way in which he was sent, that it would continue with his church, that it would carry on with his church as the body of Christ. The purpose of the body of Christ is to win souls. We talk about everything that the church is. The church is a lot of things, and I am so grateful that I have a place where I can raise my children, that I have friends and family that fill voids in my life of, of, of family that I may not have. Right? I'm so thankful for the safety and the security that's in this house. The church is a lot of things, but why is the church? You would have to ask the question, why was Christ? And Christ was sent to seek and to save the lost. And the why of the church, the purpose of the church is to seek and to save the lost. The primary focus of your life should be the salvation of souls. For everybody in this room, the primary focus upon which your life is built should be the salvation of other people. That's not an extracurricular thing. That's not something that we do when we have time for it. More than our occupations, more than our money, more than literally, literally anything and everything, the primary focus of our life should be the salvation of other people. Can we stand to our feet? I'll close with this. When you think about when you think about the human body, I'm gonna tell you right now about half of what I'm about to say. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm not a doctor, but I know know a little bit. I'm I'm gonna explain it like I'm five kind of guy, right? Our bodies, we have a lot of different parts that make up our body. We have, what, like 200-something bones. We got all different kinds of muscles, different kinds of organs. When you get onto the level of actual blood cells, you're talking thousands, millions, whatever it is. There, there are so many, so many things that make up everything that, that our body is. And if I've got a member of my body that's not functioning properly, Say, say, for example, I call my doctor, and I tell my doctor, my, my hand isn't working. I can't move my fingers. This would be a little more dramatic and probably an emergency if you actually woke up paralyzed. But to say my, my hand, I'm, I'm trying to move my hand, and my fingers won't move, and it won't, I, I can't. Your, your doctor is not going to cut open your hand to see what's wrong with your hand. There's going to be an understanding, to put this in the most elementary terms, there's going to be an understanding that there is a problem with the connection between your hand and your head. We, we, our brains are constantly sending messages to our limbs and to our muscles and to different parts of our body. And those parts of our body send messages back to the brain. This is how we move. This is how we smell. This is how we feel pain. This is how we interact with our world. It is through connection with our head and the rest of our body. And a body that is not functioning properly represents, as far as inability to move, represents an issue with the connection between the body and the head. So often we, we, we look at these things, oh, I need to teach more Bible studies. I need to get more involved with this. I need to try harder. I need to, I need to, I need to, I need to. And we, we take on, remember we said at the beginning, God doesn't need you for anything. You don't, you don't need to do anything. He, he, takes, he takes pleasure and desires having a relationship with you. He, he has given you an opportunity to be a part of what he's doing in this world. Don't, just, just let go of the pressure. 
God's given you an opportunity to play a part in this, right? But we take on this pressure. I need to do more of this and more of this and more of this and more of this. And if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of the problem usually comes from lack of connection between us and him. Right, a fully functioning body. A fully functioning body part does not have a mind of its own. I, I don't have a hand that just spontaneously decides it wants to go up in the air and I, there's nothing I can do about it. That'd be nuts. I don't have any, any part of my body that just does whatever it wants to do on its own. Everything that every part of my body does comes from a connection from the head. It comes from a message that is that, that God who created all things, this is the way that he set it up. And this plays out in that body of Jesus Christ. Right? This, this body of Christ who says, I've only come to do the will of God of my father there is nothing that i do that i do on my own but i am just an instrument for the one that sent me and he goes on a step further hey you who have been following me for the last several years the same way that i was sent and y'all know how i was sent because i've been talking about it and talking about it so this this wasn't anything foreign to them the way that i was sent my my intention is for you to be sent in that same way And Paul goes on to say, you are now the body of Christ. The church does many things. The church has one primary purpose, is to reach this world. Your life has a lot of different things that make up what your life is. The primary purpose of your life and of my life is to reach the people that are around us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to open up these altars Y'all can come pray about whatever you feel the Lord leading you to pray about. Maybe you need to reconnect with God, right? Maybe, you, maybe you're struggling. Paul, Paul explained that we are motivated and we are compelled by the love of Christ. For him, it went beyond something that was obligatory, but it was something that the love of Christ so moved him when he saw other people. Why? Because when Jesus saw the crowds, he took compassion on them. And Paul understood, I am now the body of Christ. And and maybe you need to talk to God about the way that you see other people. Maybe you need to talk to God about where you spend your time and what takes up your focus and what takes up your priorities. But we would just want to open up these altars or you can pray where you're at. But let's just take some time and let's talk to the Lord about this. I believe God wants to deal with us today about our understanding of of who it is that the Bible says we're supposed to be as the church. Hallelujah. 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 God, if there's anything in me that opposes what you're trying to do, God, if there's any part of me that's resistant to what you want to do, God, I lay that down before you at this altar tonight, God. God, I pray that you would deal with me about anything in me that's resistant to your will. God, I desire to be used by you, Lord, in a way that whatever you say, I won't fight you, I won't resist you, God. Lord, it doesn't matter if it'll compromise my reputation or it'll compromise my my plans for my future or it'll compromise my comfort, God. Lord, I pray that you'd forgive me for putting other things before the purpose to which you've called me. I pray, God, that you would forgive me for prioritizing temporary things, God, momentary things, God, carnal things, God, over the purpose that you've called me to. God, I want to be that vessel that can be used by you. I want to be that conduit, God, so that if there's someone in my life that you are trying to reach, someone in my life, God, that you are trying to reconcile with someone, God, that you've been chasing after, someone, God, that you robed yourself in flesh and died for, God. I want to be that conduit that you can reach them through. 
God, I don't want to be an obstacle to you chasing down one of my brothers or my sisters, God. I don't want to be an obstacle to your grace in their life, God. But I want to be a channel that you can flow through. I want to be, God, a conduit that your love can flow through. God, I want to be a conduit that your voice can speak through. God, I want to be a conduit that your will can move through, God. God, I pray that this church would make an impact in this city that's equivalent to what you would have done had you been here in flesh. God, I pray that this church would continue the ministry of the body of Christ in the land to which we've been called and to which we've been sent. God, I pray that my family members and my co-workers and my classmates and the people with whom I interact, God, would feel your love when I speak, would hear your voice when I minister to them, God. And I pray that there would be nothing in my life so inconsequential as money or popularity or or ambitions, God, or reputation that would get in the way of what you're trying to do in their lives, God. God, help me to not be so prideful that I put my comfort upon their eternity that I put my comfort, God, above their relationship with you. God, that I put myself and my will above yours and what you're trying to do, God. Come on, let the Lord hear your voice tonight. I believe somebody in this house tonight needs to repent. Oh, we spend way too much time and way too much thought and way too much focus on things that do not matter. Things that when we pass away, they're going to pass away with us. And they don't matter in the context of eternity. I pray that we would refocus and realign ourselves with the purpose of the body of Christ that we would avail ourselves with the mind of Christ. Come on, let the Holy Ghost minister to you tonight. Let God hear your words tonight. God wants to use you God wants to reach this city. I know we talk about expanding our church from a certain number to a certain number, but there are tens of thousands of people in the city of DeLand. There are hundreds of thousands of people in Volusia County. There are millions and millions of people in Central Florida, and God desires to reconcile Himself to every single one of them, and He's just looking looking for a church, for a body who will avail themselves to his will and to his voice and to his prompting so that he can do what he desires to do. Why don't you let the Lord know that you'll be available to him? Why don't you let the Lord know that you'll be open to what he wants to do, that he can use you? That you won't get in the way. That your will won't get in the way. That your ambitions won't get in the way. Sayete, 
Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost won't let us just move past this moment tonight. I know it's late and I know we're tired and I know we've got things on our mind, but God's trying to deal with us as a church. We need to know who we are. We need to know why we are. We need to know why we've been sent. We need to avail ourselves to what he's trying to do in this city through us.